Um, okay, um, we have let the participant uh, in the room. Yeah, we can start now. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tongi. I'm from the Singapore Bar Association's Access to Justice charity called the Law Society Pro Bono Services. I'll be one of your uh, panelists for today. Um, so delighted to um, uh, be with you virtually, and we're looking forward to uh, this session. Um, so as you are aware, uh, the theme for this conference is institutionalizing pro bono and access to justice systems. And at the close of yesterday's plenary, uh, Bruce Lasky uh, spoke about the importance of bar associations as institutions to strengthen pro bono. Um, so also over the course of the last two days, uh, you have heard um, a number of representatives from bar associations speaking about how uh, their members have been involved in pro bono. Uh, yesterday at the plenary, uh, Lochana Kemtong spoke on the great progress made by the Lao Bar Association in supporting pro bono and legal aid over the last two years. Um, Samantha Chong uh, from the Bar Council of Malaysia gave an excellent presentation on that uh, association's work for many, many years. She spoke about how um, uh, training lawyers before they qualify uh, to be lawyers in uh, Malaysia must do uh, some pro bono hours of attachment, which is compulsory. Um, I also had the privilege of being in the session uh, to hear our brothers and sisters from the integrated uh, bar of the Philippines and the American Bar Association. They spoke on an amazing partnership to respond to access to justice challenges for underserved communities. So in this conference, we've heard of many great examples of bar associations actually supporting uh, their members to do pro bono to support uh, legal aid. However, um, this morning, we're gonna focus uh, on what we call first order questions. Um, you know, why should bar associations care whether or not the members do pro bono? Uh, isn't pro bono just a form of individual volunteering best left to lawyers to do themselves? Or worse, isn't pro bono a threat to lawyers' livelihood and therefore should be discouraged? But I'd like to paraphrase what uh, Patrick Burgess and some of the other speakers have shared over the last two days. Pro bono is good for the soul of the legal profession. It's where lawyers find deep meaning um, and purpose in their work, where they grow and mature as lawyers. And it's also through pro bono, that's how the legal profession can show its value uh, to society by helping to ensure access to justice for all. So besides exploring the why uh, of why bar associations should support and strengthen pro bono, uh, we will also be exploring the what, right? So what exactly, what institutional role can they play? You know, what does that look like in practice? And for that, um, during the course of this session, uh, we'll have examples of bar associations supporting strength and pro bono. Uh, three countries will be featured, uh, Nepal, uh, Singapore, uh, and Australia. And also during the discussion, uh, we'll look at what are some challenges for bar associations to institutionally support pro bono, and how can these be overcome? Uh, because it's not always easy to uh, get this started as well. Um, We'll finally wrap off with um, how to do it, go about it. So at the end of the session, as we explore uh, you know, these things together, we'll talk about how practically to uh, get bar associates engaged in pro bono and how to go about it in a way which helps to scale up um, efforts to help um, marginalized persons or communities um, in your respective countries. So um, this will be the uh, rough uh, session overview. So I've just gone through the session objectives, after which I'll give introduction to my other panelists and co-facilitators. And we'll then have a Zoom poll, uh, which will be just for you to respond on whether or not you're a member of a bar association, yes or no. After that, uh, we'll get to know each other on a more intimate basis. Uh, we'll be having three breakout rooms. And this is where you can share uh, from your jurisdictions about your bar association and the role it plays in supporting uh, pro bono. Uh, does it support pro bono? If yes, why? If not, why not? And uh, this will be very interesting because I think 
uh, the benefit of uh, uh, coming together as we learn from one another um, and also any other challenges you may want to share as well too. Uh, after the breakout rooms, we'll come back to the main session and that's when we'll have the uh, examples of bar support for pro bono. The three countries will present in turn. Please ask questions using the chat function during that period of time. Um, so uh, while, while Saraj is presenting or I'm presenting or uh, uh, later Mark as well, we'll try to field questions and answer it uh, you know, uh, uh, during our presentation as well. We'll then go for the second round of uh, breakout rooms uh, where after having seen the different countries, the different perspectives, um, you uh, as participants can discuss some of the key ingredients that you've observed for a productive relationship between our associations, lawyers and pro bono work. What are the three or five factors that you think are important uh, to be in place uh, to get the Bar Association to support pro bono work as well. And then finally, we'll come back again in the main session and we talk about what works. That's where each of the breakout rooms will share on what was discussed and we'll look at practical ways of applying this uh, no matter at what stage your Bar Association is in terms of um, uh, supporting uh, pro bono. Okay, uh, with that overview, uh, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, our panelists for today. So, um, uh, the first uh, presenter later during the country uh, presentation will be Saraj K. Gimri, um, who is speaking on the Nepal Bar Association support of pro bono. I had the absolute pleasure of meeting Saraj in um, the Asia Pro Bono Conference in Nepal, where uh, he is a passionate advocate for moving uh, his Bar Association uh, to support pro bono work. And in fact, I think he played a key role in terms of the framing of the pro bono guidelines that was introduced by the uh, Nepal Bar Association. So Saraj is a great person to ask questions on how to get things going practically and about a very important factor about leadership at the bar level, um, you know, to get bar uh, support going as well. Uh, we'll have uh, Mark Woods uh, presenting on the Australian perspective. Uh, Mark is a, a pillar of uh, pro bono support. Um, he's a chair of the Bar Council of Australia's Access to Justice Committee. And he'll be speaking on the ecosystem of bar support for pro bono in Australia. So he has a lot of very interesting anecdotes, very uh, practical ways of uh, showing where lawyers can actually va add value uh, through their uh, pro bono service. Um, for myself, um, I'll be talking about the Singapore perspective, uh, about how uh, our bar association decided to put in uh, more support for pro bono about 15 years ago and how that journey has been um, as well. Uh, we, of course, uh, have our co-facilitators. Uh, it's my pleasure to have both of them as my colleagues. Uh, so they'll be helping to um, uh, curate the discussions during the uh, breakout sessions. So um, Marjorie Kong um, is uh, overseeing uh, one of uh, our special uh, schemes, uh, Family Justice Support Scheme, that provides uh, pro bono support to foreign spouses uh, in Singapore. Um, and Go Chen Wei um, also oversees a number of schemes, but one of them is our support for migrant workers in Singapore with uh, pro bono legal help as well. Um, both incidentally were uh, criminal legal aid scheme fellowship uh, fellows with us. So um, for a period, we're just doing a full on public defender's work uh, under the office. Okay, so with this, I'm going to launch uh, the Zoom poll. Uh, it's very simple, yes, no. Uh, are you a member of a bar association? So you should see that appearing on your screen uh, very shortly. So please uh, just take a few seconds to just indicate uh, whether you're a member or not of uh, a bar association. Okay, a lot of responses coming in. Um, I think we've Roughly done half of the attendees. So just wait a bit longer. So if you've just uh, come into the session, uh, we're doing a Zoom poll, uh, just asking of whether or not you are a member of the Bar Association, yes or no. Okay, so I'll now uh, end the poll and uh, share the results. So as you can see, uh, it's roughly a one third, two third uh, uh, split. Um, so one third of you are members of our associations, uh, two thirds of you are not. 
But for those of you who are not, um, I'm sure you're from either NGOs uh, that work with uh, lawyers um, or even bar associations. Uh, you may be from um, uh, capacity building uh, partners who are supporting um, access to justice initiatives. Uh, you may be law students, you may be uh, in-house counsel as well. And your views are very important in, in this uh, arena because uh, it'd be very interesting to hear your aspirations of what you would like to see from a bar system is strong for pro bono work because it helps uphold rule of law and other areas of uh, civil society as well. Okay, great. Um, so with that uh, overview, uh, we'll go into our first um, breakout. Oh, did I share the results? Yeah, I did. Okay. Uh, our first breakout session. So there'll be three breakout sessions. Um, out of the three, um, one of the rooms will provide a uh, Lao language interpretation another one um, in Myanmar, Myanmar language interpretation. Um, so when you join um, I, um, any of the rooms, if you require the Lao or Myanmar, do look out for the room that actually provides uh, those interpretation services. And essentially what we're looking at is um, for you participants to share about the role your bar association plays in supporting pro bono. You can use the chat function. Um, if you'd like to uh, voice out, uh, put up your hand using the uh, emoticon in Zoom and then one of the facilitators will call on you to basically share um, and talk. I mean, is it a case where uh, is your bar association actively supporting or even discouraging? If they're supporting, how are they uh, supporting? And uh, just give uh, your perspectives um, as well. Okay, so um, I think the breakout rooms uh, should be ready. Uh, so if the uh, secretary, uh, is, are the breakout rooms ready? Ms. Salin? Yeah. Okay, so um, if the breakout rooms are ready, uh, please uh, go into one of the three uh, breakout rooms and then we'll start the discussion there uh, shortly before we come back to the main session. Yeah. Good, good morning, everyone. Now, uh, the party uh, uh, activity in the small breakout room. Uh, if you are, uh, if you are Myanmar, if you can uh, click join the Myanmar room. And if you allow participants, you can click to join the Lao language room to participate uh, in the in the small workshop for 15 minutes and then we will come back to the main room. If you could not find the breakout room, you can click on the three dot icon on the menu bar and select uh, your preferred breakout room. We have three rooms, English language room, the first one, and the second one is Myanmar language room. And the last one will be loud like this. And PDO. Uh, hello. Hello, Mr. Lin. 
ในของ breakout room ทีมีเรา participant อ่ะมันตั้ง simultaneous interpreter ก็ได้เขาไป breakout room เท่านั้นด้วยอะไรตั้งให้เราเนี่ยอ่า interpreter ตั้ง breakout room ก็ได้ให้เพื่อนเปิดเพื่อนเปิดเลยอ๋อโอเคอ uh, currently we are having a uh, small group activity. If uh, Myanmar participant and La Paz participant would like to engage in the interactive uh, breakout, you can go to the breakout room by click the three dot icon on the menu bar and select the uh, pre your preferred breakout room. We have three rooms. The first one is the first one will be English language room, and the second room will be uh. Myanmar language room and the last room will be Laos. Okay. Hope you joined uh, the participator for um, during the breakout to to do the group activity. Um, สบายดีน้องรัตนาอ่าน้องกดอยู่ทางอันทางอันมันมีคำว่าเบรกเอารูปเนาะน้องกดเข้าหันแล้วมันจะมีให้น้องเป็นเลือกน้องไปห้องที่สามห้องภาษาลาวหรือรูปกว่าน้องกดไปเด้อทานงเพชรทานงเพชรอยู่บอ
Oh, so sorry about that. I was on mute now. So uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, so maybe we'll uh, just ask the facilitators from um, the rooms to maybe share on what was discussed. Uh, Marjorie, do you want to start first for your room? Sure. So I was um, facilitating the room uh, with participants from Myanmar. And I, I shared, uh, there was a participant who was a paralegal who shared about how his law firm provides pro bono services. And I understand from another participant that um, apart from um, overseeing ethical issues, um, there isn't that much support from the Myanmar's Bar Association at the moment for pro bono work. Um, and I also asked them uh, what kind of support that they would like from the Bar Association. Um, I think one participant mentioned that they would like um, support regarding meeting the accused uh, accused persons because um, there are some uh, restrictions that they face with the police um, at the moment. Yeah. Thanks, Madri. Uh, Chen Wei for, for your room. Yes, um, I had quite um, active participation. Thank you very much, everyone. So uh, someone shared that for Lao Bar Association members, they're required to provide 40 hours a year of uh, legal aid uh, and represent at least one case a year, uh, do representation work for at least one case a year. So this is a requirement, um, but they still don't really have a reporting. It's a self-reporting system. Um, there's no... There's no uh, there's no way for, for, I guess, the Bar Association to really monitor apart from the representation case uh, one, once a year. So this is one of the requirements with the accreditation. Uh, it's really just self-monitoring and reporting. Uh, some of the law firms also provide support. Um, one of the law firms uh, that our participants are from, she, the law firm sorry, the law firm sets aside every Tuesday and Thursday to provide legal aid assistance specifically. So this is uh, somewhat like a legal clinic of sorts. That's all. Thank you. Um, great. Um, so for our room, we, we had a very interesting discussion. We had perspectives from uh, the US, uh, India, Australia, and Laos as well, too. Um, so again, um, uh, uh, there was a sense of really the key role that bar associations can can play in terms of either encouraging or discouraging uh, pro bono. Uh, one of the interesting points that brought, was brought up, uh, some jurisdictions uh, uh, you know, um, are making it uh, mandatory for uh, lawyers to do pro bono every year, uh, condition of the license renewal. And it was uh, a bit of discussion on whether or not that's a good thing. Uh, does it alter the nature of pro bono when it's uh, uh, you know, um, uh, made compulsory? Uh, so later, uh, when we share about the Singapore uh, uh, perspective, uh, that was something that we had to wrestle with a couple of years back. And I'll go into a bit more detail uh, during uh, you know, uh, that, uh, that portion itself. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so we now move on to um, the uh, country presentations. So as mentioned, uh, we'll have presentations uh, on, on Nepal, Singapore, uh, followed by Australia as well. So first up will be uh, Nepal, and um, uh, Sar uh, Saraj will be presenting on this. Saraj, over to you. Thank you, thank you. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I think uh, before I go on to the institutional role of bar associations, uh, well, I'll talk some um, background on the development of uh, the pro bono in our context. Well, um, again, uh, going to that one, I'd like to uh, mention that the legal service have become expensive these days and the legal aid have not reached to the uh, really the needy the people at all times. The recipients of legal aid are unable to have their legal representations in the court, the legal services or consultancies. And that is how the pro bono has become the agent of uh, access to justice. And uh, the pro bono legal services are normally associated with the lawyers and uh, actors working for justice and assisting people in need of representations in the court. Tango next, please. Yeah. yeah. So we have a supplement to state providing legal aid. Another option that we have introduced or we have recognized is the pro bono. And the pro bono have been in practice in centuries in informal structure, even in, in our context. And now the pro bono, the formalizations, the institutionalizations of pro bono have, uh, has become, and uh, the agenda now, it's a moment now. 
but the program is not mandatory in, in Nepal. The lawyers in Nepal still they devote their much time and have demonstrated their sensitivity to work for access to justice via pro bono. I can see many lawyers. They are so interested to have them listed as a pro bono lawyers whenever the call is made by the courts and tribunals in Nepal. And that is how the, the Nepalese lawyers have been taking the pro bono as a part of their social responsibility. Next, please. Please go on. So uh, thousands of lawyers in Nepal, uh, they serve the indigent clients and the lawyers have been the vital part of the system for delivery of legal services to the one who can't afford in our context. Thank you, can you go faster? Yep. The reason, uh, the reason for uh, the lawyers' responsibility is that we have the monopoly over the legal services, and uh, so the monopoly. Uh, while we exercise our monopoly, we are not focused on the clients who pay us, but also those who cannot afford the access to justice. Ten. Thank you, just a second. May I think I'll share my slides from here? Sure, Saraj. Yeah. I'm sorry. So uh, the most of, if I talk about the most of pro bono, that uh, pro bono, we, we use this and by means of legal practices. And uh, at the community level, education and awareness, outreach of legal sports, providing specialist services and filing the public international litigations, uh, public interest litigations and representations, sometimes advocacy and coordinating with stakeholders. These are the various forms that we we have we, we work uh, as a pro bono a lawyer and uh, now i'll talk to you about the uh, role of bar associations uh, i have to recall the eighth uh, law asia uh, sorry uh, at asia pro bono conference that we held in Kathmandu. and uh, what i consider is that that conference was instrumental in the police context it was a huge uh, participation of lawyers and Nepal Bar Associations and Supreme Court Bar Associations were the, self, uh, the supporting partner. And that really has brought uh, a, a momentum that really has given the importance how, of pro bono among the Nepali lawyers. And so last uh, few months back only, we concluded the first pro bono lawyers conference uh, in, in, in Nepal. That was a national conference. And uh, the Nepal Bar Associations has uh, framed the pro bono guidelines. And now Nepal Bar Association is conducting the countrywide uh, training on legal aid and uh, the uh, pro bono for the lawyers. And bar leaders have been participating in the conferences, even as a bar member, of, as, as a general member of the bar associations, I am participating in this con uh, this conference. So these all things have been very important uh, and uh, for the bar association and for the among the Nepali lawyers. And I'd like to recall the founding principle of the Nepal bar associations that it is founded on the principle of human rights, rule of law, access to justice, and access to justice that the bar that bar has taken as a founding principles. One of the means for the access to justice is the pro bono. And Nepal Nepal bar association is one of the strongest civil society body for lawyers. We have more than 20,000 lawyers associated with the Bar Association and we have only one umbrella Bar Association so that is the Nepal Bar Associations. The lawyers, they, they, they are holding the 
leadership with the promise to serve the members of the community and the country at large. And Bar Association has the influencing role in leading civil society and uh, advising to the government and even the many lawyers uh, are in the parliament who, also, who, who can have their influencing role in, in, in introducing and implementing uh, the the pro bono services into this one. So being Nepal Bar Association leading society, it has uh, played uh, an important role. And the, uh, I, I can give you the examples where the Nepal Bar Association is listing the um, of listing the lawyers who are very interested to work with pro bono and they are sending them, they are referring them to the courts, to the tribunals and even to the government authorities. So one of the good things that I can, um, I can say here is that uh, a few weeks back, the labor court has asked for the pro bono lawyers to have listed into their roster. Mm -hmm. And uh, the immigration, a month back, the immigration department, immigration tribunal have asked the list of the interested lawyers uh, to work as a pro bono. And so when they published the list, it was quite surprising that more than hundreds of lawyers, they have given their commitment uh, to work as a, a program and Nepal Bar Association is uh, felicitating for this one. So uh, Nepal Bar Association has the major agenda for the pro bono. As I said, that Nepal Bar Association has framed the guidelines, pro bono guidelines, and it is sensitizing to the pro bono services to the lawyers in the countrywide. The Bar Association is also loving with the law firms and the lawyers for supporting the pro bono. And, uh, and uh, Again, asking for the effective pro bono uh, committee uh, in the bar associations. That the bar, I hope the bar associations is in the process of framing the effective committee in the bar associations and making the pro bono uh, lawyers rush in this one. And uh, apart from that, one Nepal bar association is developing the collaboration and the hosting the conferences in this one. The bar associations, uh, if I talk more about the bar association in general, that bar associations has a very important role in implementing and introducing the uh, program. As I said, that it's not mandatory in our context, but again, in voluntary, the bar associations can have the active role in mobilizing their unit bar associations because we have 77 uh, district court bar associations and the seven high court bar associations and one Supreme court bar associations where the bar associations requires uh, requiring all the bar associations to ensure that they have the listing on the roster of the pro bono lawyers. This one. I think for now, uh, uh, regarding to the role of the bar associations, I will conclude here. And in next part, when we'll be talking about the constraint, then I'll come back with my other opinion to this one. You know, th thanks, Raj, uh, so much. I mean, I think it's very, very impressive. Uh, when I was uh, uh, in Nepal uh, for the Asia Promotion Conference 2019, what I really came across very strongly was that uh, there was a really uh, sense of very strong leadership at the bar level. Uh, to promote uh, uh, pro bono. And I think also there was support from uh, was it the Ministry of Law, Ministry of Justice as well. Uh, this idea that um, it was seen very much as a um, as a as a, a collaboration of institutions um, in which the lawyers had a very big part to play. Um, Sarge, uh, uh, before we move on to the next council presentation, can I just ask you? I mean, in terms of the uh, pro bono culture, uh, is it uh, constantly strong? Whether or not you're a junior. Uh, or mid or senior um, um, a lawyer? Was it a case where you find the junior lawyers are more in favor of pro bono? Uh, can you give some insights on that? Yeah, uh, we have a, a few uh, very uh, big law firms uh, and uh, many lawyers, thousands of lawyers worked uh, individually independently. Um, but uh, because yesterday we were talking about the responsibility of the large law firms, in our context, uh, I have not observed the large law firms giving much uh, emphasis or uh, developing their own pro bono wings into the law firm. So if when I read over the roster of the pro bono lawyers, I mostly see the young lawyers, they are interested to start the uh, pro bono uh, services. So, uh, so we still have to, that's where I was talking about that Nepal Bar Association has to lobby with the big law firms uh, where the problem can be institutionalized within the law firm. So, uh, so this is what one of the issue uh, that uh, the Bar Association, Nepal Bar Associations or the Unit Bar Association may have to focus on calling the big law firms 
firms to introduce the pro bono. But as of now, mostly the young lawyers are seem to be much interested in serving the pro bono. Th thanks, Saraj. And maybe uh, uh, later during the uh, other parts of this session, uh, there can be some brainstorming on how to get uh, you know, even the large firms to support our pro bono. And I think we'll benefit from the sharing from other jurisdictions as how that's gone about it as well. Um, so, okay, great. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, next country presentation, which will be uh, Singapore. Um, and um, just to give uh, some uh, background, um, uh, the Bar Association in Singapore is called the Law Society of Singapore. Uh, it's a, uh, what we call a fused procession, uh, pro uh, profession meaning it's advocates and solicitors. We don't have uh, uh, you know, a separation that you do have in the, in the UK. Um, and essentially the Law Society of Singapore is a creature of uh, statute. Um, it's established under the Legal Profession Act. And in terms of uh, uh, bar strength, we're numbering about 6,000 uh, members. And it's led by a council of law society, which consists both of elected members as well as statutory uh, appointed members so the key uh, areas for uh, our bar association are really in three uh, buckets. Uh, so the first one, uh, like most bar associations, is to be a representative body uh, for lawyers. Uh, we take care of the um, interests of uh, lawyers in Singapore in terms of interaction with our stakeholders. Um, uh, we basically are their voice when it comes to legal industry matters as well. Uh, the second one, which is uh, the least popular, is that uh, um, our law society also has a regulatory uh, function, meaning that um, if lawyers, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, have uh, misconduct or any type of issues, uh, our law society uh, does play an important role in terms of uh, regulation. Um, the third one uh, is uh, access to justice, and, and this is where um, uh, there's actually a, a very key role uh, for our bar association to be involved in access to justice. And in fact, it's actually um, part of its statutory uh, purposes. So statute actually provides for uh, this role in access to justice. And if you look at um, uh, Section 38 1F, it's extremely wide. It says to protect and assist the public in Singapore in all mat matters touching on ancillary or incidental to the law. So the Singapore legislative framework gives a very large role uh, to the Bar Association uh, in terms of um, assisting the public with access to justice. So the primary driver uh, that our Bar Association has uh, selected uh, to ensure access to justice is through uh, the pro bono contributions um, of, our, uh, of our members as well. So um, what happened was for, for many years, uh, a lot of lawyers uh, um, in Singapore, and I suspect for many jurisdictions, we were doing pro bono on their own um, and helping out in many uh, different ways. And it was really left to the lawyers um, individually to see how best they wanted to serve the community uh, through pro bono. Uh, but what happened in 2006 was the uh, Law Society Council decided to do a uh, landscape survey on the adequacy of uh, legal assistance for um, um, you know, persons without means to access legal services. And uh, the report um, found at the end of 2006 that uh, lawyers could do more in terms of filling up the gap. Um, uh, we do have legal aid schemes in, um, in Singapore funded by the government, but there always be areas which they don't have adequate coverage. And that's very much where the law society felt that lawyers could actually help fill those gaps, complement these legal aid schemes through the pro bono service of lawyers. So the introduced an aspirational target of 25 hours of pro bono uh, per lawyer uh, uh, per year. So aspirational is not mandatory, but also they decided to put in uh, resources to set up a pro bono services office, uh, which was first a department under the Law Society of Singapore. And the role of that office was really to look at investing those pro bono hours for needs in the community. And also uh, working to see where those gaps were uh, working with NGOs um, who may be working with vulnerable communities and seeing how in partnership uh, we could effectively um, have lawyers assist uh, really uh, marginalized uh, persons as well. Um, over the years, uh, it grew, so it set up in 2007, and uh, 10 years on, 2017, um, it was then set up as a wholly owned subsidiary um, um, on 1st of April, 2017. So in, in essence, the mission is to enable access to justice for all, 
And uh, in a nutshell, um, as mentioned, what uh, the this department of the uh, Law Society of Singapore does is that uh, it looks at um, uh, you know facilitating access to justice for the needy and vulnerable. It does it through three ways: um, legal awareness, legal advice, and uh, advocacy or representation. Uh, we develop uh, new programs to meet emerging needs of the community. But very importantly, uh, the Bar Association uh, uh, through the office tries to promote a robust uh, culture of volunteering across the profession. Um, and we also try to support uh, lawyers who may not be familiar with some of these areas, uh, which they'd like to help out with through training as well. So um, in terms of the different uh, programs that the Bar Association has, uh, one thing that we found effective was to have a wide buffet of different opportunities uh, for lawyers. Uh, the idea being that um, by having many different types of pro bono volunteering opportunities, uh, you could uh, attract uh, different levels of seniority, different levels of interest, different levels of uh, time uh, commitment as well. So at the very base level, a lot of our lawyers are involved in public legal, legal literacy programs. They go out in the community to give talks. Because of uh, uh, COVID, uh, now a is actually on webinars online as well, but ra basically raising awareness among uh, you know, people as to how the law can help them as well. Second stage is that apart from informing people, if um, anyone uh, in Singapore needs uh, basic legal advice and guidance, they can come to uh, you know, a network of legal clinics that the Bar Association runs around the whole island. So you go there for a pro bono consultation on a whole host of different um, uh, community law issues and you get accurate information and uh, referral. Um, one thing to note is uh, I mentioned earlier that we try to work very closely with NGOs uh, or social service agencies um, in, in the space. So when we talk about legal advice, we also try to ensure that if there's any social service support, uh, referrals are also made to help um, you know, persons holistically. And advocacy is basically representation. So we, we run uh, criminal legal aid in Singapore for non-capital cases, uh, but we also uh, have gone into um, gaps involving uh, family law, um, and we have another uh, program which uh, is set up specifically to take up cases should not help by any uh, formal legal aid, but where there's uh, the justice or, or what's at stake really uh, would, would, would um, necessitate a lawyer to come on board to, to, to help out as well. So I've uh, talked about this. Um, so I mentioned the, the buffet opportunity. So in advice, we have a full range. Um, we have general legal clinics, uh, but we also have ones which are specifically targeted for vulnerable communities. This could be migrant workers, foreign domestic workers. Uh, we even have a youth legal clinic. This is where young lawyers uh, advise young people because they're close in terms of generation and be better able to uh, you know, sympathize maybe with uh, the situation as well. I've already men mentioned the advocacy part, the representation. And this is, gives a, a sense of to the numbers which we are, we are helping um, in Singapore from year to year. So the key thing to uh, look at this is that we take an ecosystem approach so a part of having um, our lawyers uh, doing the pro bono work, we involve a lot of law students. Um, in Singapore, maybe of interest to um, the participants that uh, you, you can't, uh, if you're a Singapore uh, law student, you, you can't uh, uh, you know, go on to practice in Singapore unless you've done at least 20 hours of pro bono during the course of your, um, your studies. And this is mandatory. So the difference being that the view is um, for law students, uh, you know, as part of your formation as a lawyer, as part of making it part of your DNA, they should actually see access to justice early on as something which is very much part of uh, who they are uh, once they enter the profession. Um, I had mentioned uh, that uh, Singapore, we came very close to making uh, uh, pro bono mandatory for lawyers. But in the end, Bastian said, look, if, uh, if we do that, it's going to alter the whole character of volunteering uh, pro bono. So what we have is uh, what we call mandatory pro bono reporting. So if uh, when you renew your uh, license in Singapore to practice law, uh, you actually have to declare how many hours of pro bono you did in the, uh, the previous year. Uh, if you put zero, um, there's no sanction against you, but it's a kind of reminder that there is a privilege to uh, practicing law and to always bear in mind that uh, lawyers should always think about how they can use their professional skills pro bono to help those who couldn't otherwise afford um, those, those skills. Um, again, uh, one feature of our association is, which we leverage on quite a bit, is because it's a, a statutory institution, um, it help, enables us to actually have very high level uh, partnerships with government entities or other uh, you know, entities from the court as well. 
And again, that's something which is actually uh, very important in, in, in the way that we do pro bono work, because when you work uh, on these kind of uh, partnerships as well, it gets much more effective in terms of our lawyers' time spent on um, you know, helping uh, the really needy as well. Um, so uh, just to round off as well, um, as a bar association, we don't just look at uh, transactional help on a pro bono basis. We pay a lot of attention to a pro bono culture. Uh, so this is, as I mentioned, we work very closely with the law schools to actually have a lot of the law students coming in and volunteering with us uh, pro bono. Um, but Saraj, uh, to your point early, earlier about the big firms, uh, early on, we made a very intentional effort to reach the managing partners of, of law firms to come and volunteer their firms with us. Uh, it's very easy to often reach out to individual uh, volunteer lawyers, but we want it to be such that, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, law firms, if you have the managing partners who provide support, it's part about the identity of that law firm, how they're helping the community. And we found that extremely uh, uh, effective in terms of, uh, of, of getting, um, uh, you know, alignment within the profession. We, of course, recognize um, our pro bono champions. Um, every year we have uh, one member of the profession uh, who's given a promoter ambassador award, which recognizes that his or hers uh, contributions to pro bono work. It's a very high profile award recognized in the whole legal industry. And that person will go and help to evangelize about the need to do pro bono among the profession. And apart from law students, we, we work very closely with in-house counsel as well. Um, and I think one of the speakers mentioned, I, I think it was um, Patrick uh, Burgess, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, yesterday, when we talk about the pro bono ecosystem, uh, it's important to bring in, you know, uh, persons from other fields to help out as well. So just a quick example, before I close, um, recently we had a, uh, uh, detective uh, private investigation agency uh, volunteer pro bono uh, for some of our criminal legal aid ca cases as well. Um, and we have other examples. We have uh, psychiatrists who also give pro bono contributions as well too. So I think it's very important that the Bar Association doesn't see it as a, a kind of siloed activity, but really makes use of its position to reach out to all relevant areas of support that can actually help uh, with uh, pro bono itself. Uh, um, and then, of course, uh, very quickly, uh, volunteer support and training. We do a lot of training for our lawyers, especially those who'd like to help out in some areas but not very familiar. So a lot of efforts done in terms of um, manuals, training, uh, mentorship as well. So uh, that's it from Singapore. Um, and I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, we can move on to uh, Mark. Mark, would you like to start your presentation? Thank you very much, and uh, I apologise for not being there earlier and for wearing a tie today. I have just come from another presentation, so I had to run into uh, run into this room. Uh, welcome to um, uh, to those of you who have uh, just joined us, and thank you for your uh, participation and your interest in pro bono work. Can I um, uh, congratulate uh, Babsia and the organisers? By golly, what a fantastic uh, conference it's obviously been and what a difficult thing to organise. So, uh, so well done to, uh, to all concerned. I thought I would um, very, very briefly uh, talk about what um, the experience is down under. And I'm just going to uh, quickly... Oh, it's already on the screen. There we go. Um, firstly, I want to talk about what um, pro bono work is in Australia. It's pretty, pretty simple. It means the provision of legal services on a free or significantly reduced fee basis where the lawyer has no expectation of a commercial return. It doesn't mean that you've done the work and you thought you were going to get paid, but you didn't. It meant that you said it's part of my job to do this work for nothing because the full phrase, as we know, is pro bono publico, that is for the public good. Pro bono schemes are different to legal to funded legal aid programs. That's where the government or a charity or someone actually puts in money so that the lawyers themselves do get paid, generally at a much reduced rate for the work that they do. And then there's this strange thing, largely in civil cases, called contingency fees. That's where the lawyer says, look, I will do this case and I won't charge you a fee unless you win. And if you do win, I'm going to take some of those winnings as a payment of my fees. That's not pro bono work either, because the expectation is that you're going to win. Otherwise, you wouldn't have bothered to take it on. Now, let's just uh, thank you. 
First thing for a bar association to do, and by the way, in Australia, we have uh, lots of states and territories. We're a federation and they each have their own bar association or law society or both. And then there's a national organisation, which I represent, the Law Council of Australia. And each of those have a role to play in pro bono. But let's talk about those, the important ones, those who need our services. There are those who simply cannot afford to retain a lawyer of their own, those for whom there is no funded legal aid because they don't do that sort of work or the government hasn't provided money for it. And then there are the, some of the forgotten uh, people. They are organisations, kindergartens, charitable groups who don't have sufficient money to engage lawyers to undertake their legal work our profession is proud to say we do that work pro bono so they can uh, regulate themselves, so they can comply with government regulations, so they can know what to do when someone in the organisation does the wrong thing. It's a vast area of pro bono work that so many of our um, civil lawyers undertake. Then we look at, OK, we've got lots of people who need lawyers. Who's going to provide them? Well, there are people who are lawyers practising on their own account. There are those who are employed by other lawyers in private law firms. There are lawyers who work for government departments. There are lawyers who work for large corporations that have their own legal organisation. There are lawyers who work in community organisations or community legal centres. And finally, and this is something we must never forget, there's a lot of paralegals or even non-lawyers who work in various professions that help us to undertake that pro bono work, as Tango just said before, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on. You've got those who need pro bono services. There are those who are prepared to provide them. How does one find the other? We call it bridging the gap. And that's where bar associations right around the region are uniquely placed. Legal professional associations know a lot about us lawyers. We have to fill out, you know what it's like, forms and tell them everything about us so they know what we do, what we're good at and what we've got time to do because we can tell them. Somebody needs to triage legal pro uh, problems, to use a medical term. We just work out whether or not the person has um, a valid case, whether they've got merit, whether or not we're going to use valuable pro bono lawyer time to work on their behalf. Bar associations are uniquely placed to work out what it is that uh, this person needs in terms of legal services. So in most Australian jurisdictions, the bar associations or law societies or um, clearing houses, as they're called, are the first port of call for the people who want to have pro bono assistance but really don't know where to go. Bar associations are also um, highly effective in overcoming the regulations, the rules that stop uh, lawyers from doing pro bono work. So, for example, um, if in our jurisdictions you uh, tell the court you are acting or a party to a dispute, then you remain on the record. You have a responsibility to the court for all of the uh, happenings that need to occur in a court case. Whereas it may well be that whilst you're not prepared to do all of that work, you're prepared to do some of it. So bar associations are effective in liaising with our courts to say it should be OK for a lawyer to do only part of the work because that's all they've got capacity for. In most jurisdictions, lawyers are required to carry their own insurance. Now, some lawyers, like those who work for corporations or those who work for government, don't need that. But if they're going out there to help people pro bono, they certainly do. And bar associations and the agencies that they're involved with, in our own case, the Australian Pro Bono Centre, have been able to 
uh, work out policies of insurance so that if you do a pro bono job and you don't otherwise have insurance, you can get insurance so that if you make a mistake, your family doesn't lose their home, for example. The second last thing I want to talk about is the role which we lawyers play when there are natural disasters. And the Lord knows there have been plenty of them during the course uh, of the past 12 months since we last met. Um, floods, bushfires, tsunamis, earthquakes, the list goes on. And what that does to people is devastating. And what a lot of people don't understand, well, of course, we need a fireman there to hold a hose. Uh, or someone with a boat to rescue people who are flooded. But after that, people need to be able to establish their identity. They need to be able to rebuild their uh, profile as a citizen. They need to be able to communicate with government agencies to get income, uh, with um, uh, charitable agencies to get food, with um, uh, insurance companies to get compensation. And we lawyers, have a unique role to play in that because uh, in so many ways, it's difficult to reconstruct those sorts of identities and to ensure that people's rights are protected. Those rights, we don't want them to go the same way as the tree that's burned down or the river whose banks are, um, are smashed away by floodwaters. And finally, friends, what else we, what we do is we are uniquely placed to say there's something wrong with this law. There's something wrong with the way in which we do things. We want law reform. And very, very few lawyers get paid for the work they do in advocating to governments and courts and those in positions of power to say we want things changed. It's a skill which requires research abilities, advocacy abilities, and a, commit, and a time commitment to get to the bottom of the problem and do something about it. And that's another piece of pro bono work that is often forgotten. I'll see if we can get the next slide up. If we Just some practical examples of pro bono work in Australia. The lowest courts in the um, jurisdiction in some are called magistrates courts or local courts or courts of petty session. They're the people who are picked up for stealing things from shops, for getting too drunk, for smashing their car up, that sort of thing. Um, the government legal aid services very, very rarely uh, are appropriate or indeed are funded to look after those people, yet the effects of adverse decisions on them can be devastating, often for the rest of their lives. So a duty lawyer service where someone says, look, I will go down to the court and I'll be available free of charge to people to listen to what their case is about, give them advice on what to do. And if they need some representation that can be done straight away, we'll do them. In some cases, I know I take my, my role in that regard pretty seriously and might have 20, 20 customers a day uh, who are there. It's stressful work, it's hard work, but cheers from the doctor The doc brief is the system that has um, worked. I'm not sure, just to an echo here, but uh, the doc brief system is um, one where the magistrate or the judge sees that a person is really in need of some assistance from someone who knows the law, and they'll say, righto there, uh, so Roger, you can take this person on as a favour to the court. There's disaster legal help that I've spoken to, lawyers who actually go out, roll up the sleeves and sit there with their laptop and their dodgy internet connection so that they can assist people who come to a relief centre with really just the clothes off their back. Legal education, as they do in Singapore, let's make our citizens more aware of how they can use the law to ensure their rights are protected. We, what do we lawyers do? We're communicators. We convey information. We advocate ideas. And helping people to do that themselves is a fantastic way of making sure their rights are protected. What's the old story? 
um, give a man a fish and he'll eat today, show him how to fish and he can fish, he can eat for the rest of his life. It's the same with teaching people about their, um, uh, their legal rights. Substantive casework, this is where something's going to go on for months, if not years, uh, providing every service that's needed so the person can have their rights protected. It's all about equality of arms, us making up the gap to make sure that the citizen who is sued or prosecuted has a fighting chance in our courts. And finally, the transactional pro bono services that I've spoken about, setting up a constitution for a community group, setting up a structure by which members of a group who are fighting with each other can have that dispute resolved. That sort of um, uh, drafting work, which takes a long time, doesn't um, get mentioned too often uh, in the hero stakes, but is so very, very important. These are all practical examples of what we can and will do. Look, the key ingredients are really, really, really simple. Um, you've got willing lawyers. I've never met a lawyer, and I've been in practice for 41 years, and I've never met a lawyer who simply says, look, if you're not prepared to pay me, too bad. I'm not going to do the work. Never met one. How do we make sure that's harness? We make sure it is by making sure that our bar associations understand the needs and have a mechanism by which the, the requirement for services are properly triaged so that the, the best lawyer who's prepared to do that sort of work for that sort of time can be uh, obtained. Thank you very much. Um, Mark, thank, thank you so much for that. Um, you know, excellent presentation. And I, I think uh, you really um, highlighted how robust uh, uh, and how varied uh, and how, uh, you know, how, uh, how, how critical, uh, you know, pro bono service is among uh, lawyers in Australia and in, in so many different areas and so many different dimensions as well. Um, I'm just curious, I mean, um, the pro bono uh, culture in Australia, was it a kind of ground up movement or did the bar associations in the different states take a, a, a you know a, a, a leading role in this, or is it a, maybe a mix of, of both? Uh, you know, you had ground up as well as bar association support as well. It it was um, a um, something which uh, has been a feature of the Australian profession for uh, look at least a hundred and fifty years. Um, my own bar association, the Law Institute of Victoria, was formed in eighteen fifty nine. Uh, as a group of, um, of uh, people who wanted to meet for bread and cheese, uh, and I suspect the odd glass of wine. And they spoke about people in a very small part of um, the then British Empire uh, who couldn't afford their services and what they were going to do. And eventually, more um, robust, more organised schemes um, came into existence and then it wasn't until the mid uh, 20th century that governments uh, were prevailed upon to actually fund legal aid when we, the profession, were able to say, there's uh, thousands and thousands of our fellow citizens who will never, ever get uh, the um, uh, ability to have a lawyer than they, uh, and they need them in these particular areas. Criminal law, family law, um, some of the areas of dealing with governments. But it's very much been a um, driven from the uh, the ground up, and the association, being representative of the members of the profession, have acted upon that to take on the role that uh, they now do, uh, as indeed they do in your jurisdiction, Tonga. Great. Um, I've, I think Simon Kenny, you've got your hands up. Would you like to ask a question? Oh, you need to unmute first. Yep. Y yes. 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 Can I be seen? Uh, Simon, I, you need to mute your microphone. Uh, Mark, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, maybe this is too specific uh, a question to Australia, but it seems to me that the way that pro bono is organised now, particularly amongst the Victorian bar, is that...
Sorry, I, you've just gone off. I can't hear you now. Sorry. Uh, Simon, uh, your your mic went off. Do you want to use the chat function? Uh, you can put your question there, and then uh, we'll, we'll we'll come to it. If you use the chat function, maybe we want to Michael Gill. Uh, Michael, would you like to ask a question? Okay, I don't think we can hear Simon or Michael. We'll just wait for the question to come in through chat. There've been a few more questions that have come in through chat as well. Um, so one is from Yat Tinza. Um, so Saraj and uh, Mark, the question was during the pandemic, um, how, have, how do the bar associations help with legal awareness to the marginalized groups? And to what extent do you think it's successful? So basically, of course, during pandemic, there are a lot of social uh, safe, safe, safe distancing measures as well. Um, and if the bar, your bar associations were actually involved in terms of legal awareness as well, how would you reach some of these uh, marginalized groups uh, with uh, uh, legal information. What we've done is to um, take um, uh, an example from the medical profession. Um, during the course of the uh, pandemic, we found that um, uh, doctors were not in a position to see uh, all people, uh, and indeed, uh, it was a, um, a um, uh, pandemic control measure that uh, patients saw their doctors in fora like this, like Zoom or other platforms. And what uh, we found was that um, uh, members of the public can easily make a time to see uh, their legal person and um, get some advice. Ultimately, the person can take instructions. And frankly, there was no interruption to our pro bono work in Australia because we all became experts in how to use the Zoom. And not only that, we were also able to ensure that the, the wheels of justice continue to roll on, not as fast, uh, but nonetheless effectively by use of virtual courtrooms, um, rather like the setup that we've got for today. So it's been a reasonably um, smooth sail through the pandemic, at least from the point of view of delivering legal services pro bono in Australia. Thanks. Saraj, do you want to share your, the experiences in Nepal? Um, yeah, uh, we have uh, a very remarkable uh, situations uh, during the pandemic time uh, when the COVID broke out and uh, the lockdown on Kalaf. Everything was closed, even access. Hello. Yep, Saraj, we can hear you. Okay. So everything was closed, uh, especially uh, in the cases of domestic violence and the gender-based violence. We had a closure of the police complaint, closure of the district administration office, closure of the court. So uh, a few um, activist lawyers, including me and uh, the Rosni here, this my side advocate Rosni, um, um, apart from that one, uh, many uh, you know, public interest lawyers and even the bar associations, we went to the Supreme Court through various uh, uh, public interest litigations uh, to ensure that the access to justice is secure. And we have, we, we have another important case where a lawyer was detained during the lockdown. And uh, in the in the of habeas corpus, the Supreme Court say that no movement of lawyers can be restricted even during the time of the lockdown when they are in the course of justice. So uh, we, uh, and even bar associations called for the lawyers uh, to serve, uh, to serve, provide services in the virtual form, in the advisory form, or in, in, in other, other uh, electronic form to assist and advise to the victims, uh, to the, um, uh, those who have suffered from gender-based violence and sexual violence. I think these are some important things that uh, we did during the time of pandemic and lockdown. Well, Saraj, that's really fantastic. I mean, I mean, just to echo, uh, in Singapore, it was it was, uh, it was also similar in the sense that uh, the 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 safe distancing measures, uh, a civil line of COVID, is actually lawyers trying to discover Zoom. You know, other ways of actually uh, using electronic means to reach out, uh, which they hadn't done before. Um, so for us, what was interesting was, as mentioned, uh, we, we process a lot of criminal legal aid cases. And because of the very good relationship with the Singapore Prison Service, um, our office were able to call using the handphones directly into lockup 
to actually do um, the means testing of the applicants as well. And our lawyers were also able to uh, dial in when doing the merits testing to also give advice uh, to residents. So that's un unprecedented. But it's a case where I think generally there was uh, a lot of creative ways of working with other partners to uh, bring assistance um, across uh, to those who are marginalized. And of course, working with NGOs uh, who would be uh, very familiar with um, the areas and needs and working alongside them in terms of providing um, help and support. Uh, we had an earlier question from Dr. Shashi Adike. Uh, she asked for, uh, in this case, uh, the Committee Legal Connects. How far do they provide legal aid for marginalized communities, especially domestic violence cases in Singapore? So, uh, I mean, yes, I mean, uh, maybe similar to what Saurad shared, I mean, during the pandemic, uh, there was a, uh, an apparent rise in terms of domestic violence cases. So uh, we, we do, uh, the clinics, of course, they provide general advice, which definitely would cover domestic violence. Um, as mentioned earlier, we don't just look at the legal aspect in terms of advice, but we also work with um, uh, partner organizations that specialize in helping domestic violence cases. So very often, if a case would come across to the local clinics, which will also run virtually as well too, um, during the pandemic, um, they would not only get uh, advice on how to get protection orders uh, in the courts, but also how they could uh, uh, link up with one of these domestic violence specialist organizations for uh, holistic um, help as well. Um, maybe just on this uh, 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 the point, I mean, Mark and, and Saraj, I mean, is it a case where uh, in terms of the pro bono efforts of lawyers bar association, I mean, do you actively look at uh, additional partners in terms that can help holistically the uh, uh, you know, the, the persons who are assisting. So it's just not just legal because that's often the tip of the iceberg, but your whole, a whole host of other issues that also need to be dealt with as well. Um, maybe Mark, you can, you can try uh, answer that first. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, it's very, very rare that legal issues can be solved in a vacuum. And one of the uh, important parts of the Bar Association's work and the Australian Pro Bono Centre's work is to bring together uh, lawyers willing to work pro bono and those other professionals who can assist. Um, so there are the obvious ones, the doctors and the nurses and the pharmacists, but there are also the accountants uh, and, the, uh, and the engineers and, and those sorts of people. We've gone even further than that and actually set up uh, community uh, legal and, for example, health services, which actually have doctors and lawyers in them to deal with um, whatever the, uh, the, the, uh, the problem is. Um, during the, um, the pandemic, Australia was not immune from what you've described. Our um, uh, incidents of family violence sadly increased. And indeed, we had some of the most severe lockdown restrictions anywhere in the world for a lengthy part of the pandemic in 2020 and 2021. And during that time, uh, regrettably, fractious families really imploded. And uh, it was often very important for doctors receiving those who were sadly uh, injured as a result of serious violence, having to then refer them to the members of the profession who were prepared to assist. Now, some of those were eligible for uh, funded legal services, but many, many weren't. And so I think that the uh, ties between uh, the professions has strengthened during the pandemic. Thanks, Mark. Saraj, uh, did, um, in, in terms of the Nepal Bar Association, I mean, the lawyers, do they work with NGOs or uh, social service agencies to provide holistic help uh, to persons who are in legal crisis? Well, uh, I don't. Uh, I don't think uh, there is such kind of relations. But definitely, uh, Nepal Bar Associations has a partnership with uh, various organizations, including UNDP. And uh, I, I have to refer a few examples that I missed uh, last time. That Nepal Bar Associations uh, had a uh, five, six years, seven years partnership with the DLA Piper. Uh, Andrew uh, Valentine is here. Uh, where we, we initiated, I was the coordinator for the seventh time uh, training, international training for human rights. That was absolutely pro bono uh, training where Nepal Bar Associations, DLA Piper, uh, UNDP, and the human lawyers joining hands. We started uh, you know, training to the human lawyers, 60 human lawyers at one time with the two group. And that went for seven times in Nepal. That is one of the very important things uh, regarding to the part 
partnership Nepal Bar Association's hand with the DLA Piper and Andrew was one of the international trainer and coordinator from the DLA Piper. Apart from that one, Nepal Bar Association's also had a partnership with uh, uh, the um, uh, the Somji, I can see the Som Luitel uh, here, uh, where Nepal Bar Associations and uh, the the institution that we have started a, a loose network of the pro bono lawyers in Nepal for the first time, and we conducted the national uh, seminar, national conference on the uh, of the pro bono lawyers, uh, where Nepal Bar Association was a partner, and. I will uh, like, and I'm reiterating that the eighth Asia Pro Bono Conference uh, happened in Kathmandu, where Nepal Bar Associations uh, was also one of the partner into this one. And apart from that one, the UNDP is there, which is supporting the Nepal Bar Associations to conduct the nationwide uh, training uh, for the lawyers. And uh, now the Nepal Bar Associations has multiple trainings uh, in in the various parts of the country uh, in the bar associations on the access to justice and pro bono. So, so now the Nepal Bar Association has opened uh, and uh, invitations for the organizations they are in trust to uh, support uh, for the bar, for the lawyers and for the pro bono. So we have developing a good relations uh, with the other social organizations in our context too. Saraj, thank you so much for that. I think when we talk about key ingredients, if you can see, uh, when bar associations, um, because of their position, they are able to have very uh, key strategic, uh, uh, you know, relationships with other partners who can actually, uh, you know, make sure that you have more holistic outcomes for those who are being helped as well. Um, with that, we'll move over to Michael. Michael, do you, would, you, would you like to ask your question? I was going to respond to your question a little while ago about how did it happen in Australia? Yes, please. Yeah. <clears throat> and of course, um, I've lived through most of that, starting with in the mid 60s, the fact that um, the law societies took on the banks to hand over money earned on trust accounts. And that source of funds led to a huge amount of money available for legal aid, which the law societies themselves administered until most of it was taken over by government in the late 1970s. So in the early 70s, I think coming off the back of the revolutions of the 60s and the emergence of consumer issues, lawyers who had done it very traditionally, and I want to thank Mark for his excellent exposition on that, and particularly as a former law council president, it's just great to see the way this has gone on. But um, we started with the formation of legal referral centres and legal education programs, we then had the Whitlam government come in with Lionel Murphy as the Attorney General, who put a huge focus on legal aid, the Australian Legal Aid Office, funding legal aid centres, all of those sorts of things. Um, by the early 80s, we were realising that the cost of legal services was just prohibitive and other ways and means had to be found so that people could access it. Uh, the Law Council spent a lot of time looking at the concept of um, legal expenses insurance, but that went nowhere. And Australia at the same time, State and Commonwealth, was going through a revolution where many legal services that had traditionally cost a lot of money and involved fully trained lawyers could now be delivered by slim down agencies and good paralegals and well-trained people. And I think, Mark, coming back to your point, one of the ongoing challenges for pro bono is law reform and procedural reform, because we just can't keep throwing people at ever more complicated and complex methods of delivering legal services or resolving disputes we've got to find ways to simplify. And that's a huge role for the organized profession because law societies, bar associations and the Law Council of Australia in Australia are at the forefront of law reform. And that's a huge pro bono exercise on behalf of the organized bar itself because it provides that input to government and law reform commissions and others to get better law. Um, I think that was about it. Um, 
although one shouldn't underestimate the impact that the Victorian government had when it announced some years ago that um, if you wanted to tender for its work, you had to disclose what your pro bono track record was. And that focused the bean counters in law firms in a way that previously they hadn't. So if that just helps a bit with the history, um, that's certainly a, oh, one other good thing from the academics in the late seventies, we started to see some learnings from the United States about clinical legal education and universities in New South Wales and Victoria wanted to set up um, uh, legal advice centers as part of clinical training. That took some negotiation with the law societies, the organized bar, but eventually um, uh, as a result of that cooperation, those things worked out terribly well as well. That's it. Thank you, Michael. Uh, uh, thank you so much for that as well. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just very interesting to see the, uh, uh, you know, uh, pro bono journey in Australia as well. I'm hoping uh, maybe one day there'll be actually a book which actually documents this because in some ways it uh, kind of shows a blueprint or a way forward for a lot of bar associations to really develop and mature. Uh, Mark, there's actually a question um, from one of the participants. Um, is pro bono Australia a compulsory requirement? Uh, either at university level uh, before they enter the profession or uh, once they enter the profession? The, the, the short answer is no. Uh, and the organised profession uh, through its bar associations have consistently rejected making um, the undertaking of a certain amount of pro bono a condition of your licence to practice. But having said that, uh, Michael Gill uh, touched upon ways in which pro bono is um, uh, encouraged. Um, governments uh, in our jurisdiction, as everywhere else, are some of the biggest consumers of legal services right across the region. Um, they are invariably uh, ordinarily on one side of most disputes that come before the courts. So they purchase legal services from the profession and what uh, some, of, some governments in Australia, some levels of government in Australia have done is to say, listen, if you're not doing an appropriate uh, amount of pro bono work and we're going to call on you to account for that, we're not going to give you any of the good fee paying work that we as a government would normally purchase from you. And that's a very, very powerful uh, incentive for pro bono. It's not compulsory, but um, it sort of is. Likewise, some of our um, larger corporations uh, will, when they're deciding which law firms they're going to use to undertake work, look very closely at the um, work that they, um, uh, the pro bono work that those various firms uh, do, because they like to be associated with uh, those who are seen as doing good work. Um, in for our undergraduate. Uh, law students, uh, it is a fact that some of um, uh, the courses require them to volunteer in some community legal centres as part of the assessment process. So in a way, that's sort of um, compulsory as well. But I've got to say to you that um, one of the most powerful ways of ensuring recruitment of pro bono work is our young lawyers. They want to do good. That's why they got into the jolly job in the first place. So they're saying to firms, if you don't have a decent pro bono program, we'll go and work somewhere uh, where they do. So no, it's not compulsory. And I think it's unlikely that it will be at least uh, for the next decade or so. Uh, thanks thanks for that, Mark. Uh, it's also a trend we, we've been seeing in Singapore as well. Uh, quite a few of the young, young lawyers when they enter the profession do look for meaning and purpose that goes beyond just uh, the salary itself. And uh, they often, uh, uh, you know, will make choices, uh, you know, based on where they feel they can get those kind of uh, pro bono opportunities as well. Um, Simon, can you, you have your hand up? Would you like to ask your question, Simon? Simon, if you're speaking, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Ah, now we can hear you. Yeah. Have, I, have I got it right now? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Good. Good, good, good. Um, my question's really to Mark. It, it might be a little bit too Australia specific, but um, the way pro bono 
work is advertised and you know the, the need is disseminated at least in Victoria seems to have come down to announcements from the uh, the clearinghouse that you know this job is available and then it gets released on the Supreme Court website and inevitably snapped up by someone who perhaps hasn't got much work in their diary, might be a first year barrister and might be very junior. And it seems to me that the real people who, who are best placed to be doing that work um, miss out because they're, you know, they're busy in court, they're busy running their practices and they're not there following the, the Twitter feed or whatever and snapping up every option. I, I wonder if you see that as a problem and if you see that as being a downturn in the quality of the, the pro bono work that's being undertaken in recent years, and, and if there's a solution. Um, I personally haven't seen that as being a problem, uh, although I do acknowledge that um, in the enthusiasm for undertaking pro bono work, uh, it is now possible for some of our clearinghouse functions, either the um, legal assistance scheme run by uh, the Law Institute of Victorian Bars Pro Bono Scheme, which is administered by a wonderful organisation called Justice Connect, that they have the opportunity yeah. to specify, look, we're, we're looking for someone that's had at least five years post-admission uh, post experience um, because, it, you know, this is a very technical, complicated case. Uh, there, look, uh, there are a myriad of stories where, you know, if there is someone who wants to take on the uh, the government of Australia on some obscure constitutional point, you know, there's a, a conga line of um, of counsel who are prepared to put up their hands because they would not get that sort of case. Uh, it's yeah. a wonder. It's a wonderful. It's a wonderful problem to have. Quality control is something that uh, the clearing houses, in my experience, do uh, do take seriously. Um, one of the um, ways they do that is by um, asking the person who have they got advice from before and sometimes it's uh, been a court official or an organization official who says make sure you get a lawyer who knows about this so there's a bit of um, uh, qualitative uh, control of the selection process but it's something we need to keep looking at absolutely yeah i mean i, I suppose in some ways it's uh, an insuperable problem um you're always going to get people who are who are underqualified who want to who want to step up and perhaps see doing this work as a way of doing that. Uh, so I mean, uh, uh, you know, it, it is something which uh, 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 I mean, just generally speaking, I think for uh, most bar associations, especially I mean, for us as well in Singapore. I mean, it's, we do try to, um, uh, uh, you know, give opportunities, but as you mentioned, sometimes they may not, you know, yet have the, the level of training or experience. So it's a case where very often the bar association can play a big role in terms of providing mentorship, uh, providing supervision, uh, providing uh, materials and training as well. Uh, we have quite a large number of young lawyers who would like to do uh, criminal cases, very often in their practices, which uh, are predominantly civil or even uh, corporate as well. But it's a case where uh, we've actually developed uh, number one, a triage system where um, before a case is assigned to a lawyer, we do look at uh, the level of experience, expertise, if they're still very fresh, um, you know, you know, uh, a mentoring is given or they've even asked to go for some training as well. We've got quite comprehensive training that deals with nuts and bolts of, uh, you know, uh, criminal practice, uh, how to go about, um, uh, you know, uh, doing certain things uh, and, you um, Often, even when they are assigned a case, uh, they have access to mentors as well. So I think it's finding a fine balance where uh, the one t thing that you do don't want to come across is that if it's just pro bono, it, it, it stands for like, you know, a shoddy type of work. Uh, but at the other hand, it's with sufficient controls and sufficient support, um, you know, young, young lawyers can or inexperienced lawyers in the area can really shine, um, especially if they have a passion to uh, do good as well. I mean, we have many uh, situations where young lawyers with um, adequate uh, supervision and support um, have gone on to get, uh, you know, uh, discharges, amounting acquittals um, and other, you know, big wins very early on in, in, in terms of their practice as well. Um, so that's actually uh, quite key. Um, to, to, be, to be absolutely clear to Mark, I, I realise that 
what I said might have sounded like a criticism, and it's not. I mean, no. the standard of, the standard of the work is high. Uh, I wonder though if the the triage process to get there is is more arduous, and if there's any way of making it less arduous. I, I think that um, the key is training, and, and one of the things that I, I didn't speak about earlier on because it gets into a degree of detail when we talked about uh, family violence and the pandemic. Um, I can think of no way of uh, more traumatising a survivor of family violence than giving her a lawyer who doesn't know anything about it, yeah. <laughs> who, thinks, who thinks that, you know, you treat uh, a survivor of family violence in the same way you treat someone who's just been turfed out of their house by a bank. You know, it's quite different. It really requires a, a, a skill level in that... that um, no university law degree will ever will ever assist you with and that's why bar associations uh, have been collaborating with agencies that deal with those survivors of family violence to skill up uh, front um, uh, line service lawyers to do that work pro bono without re-traumatizing the survivor by, for example, using the accounts that they've given to doctors or other professionals rather than having to sit them down and go through the whole process of discussing it again. And that's another key role for a bar association is to set up those collaborative efforts so that we as a profession can skill up and deal with what is unquestionably the, um, the um, greatest uh, new area of legal services in the last 20 years. Can I just come back in on this on a related issue? Um, yep. I've often wondered why the organised law societies and bars haven't looked at their more senior members, people like me who are going out to full-time practice, you know, we have a great example in that famous movie, The Castle, of a senior lawyer who thought it was time to give something back. And, um, of course, when you're leaving practice, um, people think of all sorts of roles and things to do. But, you know, again, society and the profession has given us enormous skills and abilities. And why we can't better organise the oldies to play more of these roles is a bit beyond me. So, so my, Michael, th thanks for that. Uh, actually, it's quite interesting you bring it up because it's something which we were discussing at our bar association level, the huge wealth of experience, of uh, insights, of, 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 of wisdom that shouldn't be sunsetted so fast. You know, I mean, it's a case where uh, senior lawyers uh, absolutely can play a huge role in terms of uh, maintaining the best, you know, traditions of the bar, um, having a lot of know-how and experience. And so actually uh, for us, we're actually looking at coming up with a, um, a program, a couple of options. One would be uh, some of the senior lawyers who actually have given up the normal practice, but they have pro bono practicing certificates, which uh, could be under the umbrella of the, the charity uh, where we formalize stronger uh, mentoring relationships where they are more involved in terms of some of the training as well. So that's one area which uh, we've been tasked by our board to actually look in specifically. But 100%, it's a case where um, uh, I think there's a very, very uh, potent, uh, um, uh, you know, mix of bringing together, uh, you know, young, young, young lawyers who are just starting off with the, you know, the, the wisdom experience of seniority as well. I think that'll be something uh, well worth uh, looking at institutionalizing and, and you know, uh, putting uh, you know good programs in place, but um, I think we'll need to move on to the final phase as well. So just just to quickly recap, I mean, it's been a very interesting um, uh, discussion, and thank you to all the participants who uh, weighed in as well. So some of the key ingredients which were identified, you know, one one thing which is actually very fundamental, it's uh, you know a robust pro bono culture. I think that once you have that right uh, straight away, uh, it helps to move things um, in a very good. Uh, uh, manner. Uh, there's no momentum of itself that takes place as well. Uh, another key ingredient about not seeing pro bono as something which is siloed, uh, just in terms of legal, the importance of actually uh, being curious to, to see how you can help, um, you know, communities holistically working with, be it doctors or other uh, social service um, agency disciplines as well, 
um, or you know other other networks, other partners to you know provide um, that holistic support to really identify areas of need as well. Um, you know having uh, you know a wide range of opportunities. I mean, as Mark uh, and Saraj highlighted, uh, you know so many different ways that the lawyers can be helped in, and not just for transactional. Um, this idea of law reform, to me, that is actually fundamental to access of justice. If you can, you know, fine tune uh, dodgy laws, the amount of downstream benefit is actually immense as well. So um, these are some of the key ingredients, and um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure there are, there are others that uh, you know uh, we can discuss as well. But let's move on to the final uh, part of the session. You know, what works? Uh, you know, how can they be applied? But let's let's take it a bit differently. I mean. The reality is often there are many challenges, um, you know, to getting um, sometimes uh, pro bono buy-in from the Very profession, good. all the bar association as well. Uh, maybe if we can have uh, some wisdom from the panelists in terms of, you know, how can some challenges be be overcome? I mean, uh, you know, uh, you do sometimes have, uh, you know, movements saying that, uh, uh, you know, shouldn't the government be doing more? Why is it that lawyers always ask to fill up the gap in terms of pro bono or this idea that pro bono can maybe undermine, uh, you know, livelihood of lawyers as well, or you may have, uh, you know, uh, bar leadership is just not, not interested in, in this area as well. So I, I don't know, uh, you know, Mark and, and Saraj, I mean, I mean, you've been around for very much in terms of your respective uh, jurisdictions. I mean, I'm sure it kind of all be smooth sailing and, and uh, uh, super easy, but do you have any um, tips on how, uh, you know, you, you've overcome challenges which have come, come your way in terms of, uh, you know, uh, getting uh, uh, you know uh, you know, uh, support for pro bono uh, in terms of profession. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, uh, to uh, my understanding, the bar leadership must have uh, firstly they must internalize themselves uh, in their bodies and uh, that the pro bono should be kept on uh, priority. The bar leadership should develop their connections with uh, different stakeholders uh, and the civil society who works for the pro bono. Uh, the bar requires to set up their own institutional, uh, set up an, an infrastructure is another important part that I feel and uh, even their personal skills networking and liaison is important. Another important part is that many lawyers, I, I was reading uh, the content of the Bruce uh, in, in the in the message box that even uh, that is not mandatory, but the lawyers, when they provide their services, they report that to their respective bar associations. That's a good thing that uh, because of in, in the bar association, we have not developed at the recording system. So if we are giving uh, the services, we can report to the bar associations that how many hours that we have been employing into this one. And, uh, and there must be realizations uh, from the bar associations, from the lawyers, that access to justice is the fundamental part of the constitutions of the legal systems. And uh, lawyers are the major agent for these services, for this support. There must be a realization that the bar has the important institutional role to instruct, to mobilize, and to liaise with the law firms and uh, their member lawyers. And uh, the bar associations, uh, mm, such work definitely encourages the lawyers. And this is, uh, and this is also for the lawyers' opportunity to have the, to serve as a holistic approaches uh, where they they consider themselves as a, their uh, responsible, uh, mm, as a responsible professionals. Uh, mm, they consider that one on their priority. And uh, and one of the important thing that I would like to uh, mm, like to request here is that. Well, uh, we this, this, such a fantastic uh, conferences is the platform where the lawyers from various countries we, we are coming here as institutionally and as personally, and so now, I think the another step that we can do is that uh, we have to see whether the bar associations of Asia can have the common understanding, uh, can come together uh, in such a platform. Uh, and uh, develop their network and frame some guidelines uh, among the bar associations to uh, uh, to ensure that 
the pro bono is the part of the agenda and even the part of the services from the lawyers. I think that's what I would like to say. Thank, thanks, Saraj. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, Mark, do you have um, any, any uh, thoughts? I've just put in the chat a, a link to um, the International Bar Association's uh, publication. Um, one of the, um, the things we need to point out uh, as lawyers to governments uh, and to our own employers sometime is the value that undertaking pro bono work does and gives to the community. And once you see that, you realise we can't afford as a community not to have this pro bono work being done. A committee at the International Bar Association called the Access to Justice and Legal Aid Committee recently collaborated with the World Bank uh, to um, survey a variety of jurisdictions around the world and work out uh, for every $1 spent or whatever the, uh, the currency is, one euro, one peso, one drachma, whatever it is, uh, whatever, um, when governments spend one of those, how much the community gets in, in return for other government services not being uh, needed to be used because we actually prevent problems when we do pro bono work. So um, please uh, feel free to have a look at that report and use it as a lobbying tool for your bar association and for that matter for your government to properly resource the sector because the economic benefits are there for all to see, quite apart from the fact that it's the right thing to do. That's one of the ways of overcoming challenges. Point out how absolutely important pro bono work is, and people will get on board. Even the hard-nutted bean counters in your firm will understand how very important it is and use that to sell your pro bono message. No, that's such excellent advice, uh, Mark. And um, you know, one of the things is uh, it it uh, it also uh, helps, uh, as you've mentioned. Uh, you mentioned, I mean, you, when you engage uh, your government authorities, uh, you may potentially even be able to use that data, uh, those kind of uh, that kind of information to actually get funding in some ways to help support uh, some of these initiatives. And I I think it's uh, it's it's just so important to remember, um, you know, what a big difference uh, it can make to lives and outcomes of, of of people if they get advice and representation upstream up front as well. And there's a huge uh, amount of, of downstream good that, that takes place. So certainly, I mean, uh, that type of material, uh, that type of, uh, you know, framing, uh, you know, the, the importance of, uh, you know, having a supportive culture, uh, you know, pro bono and, and, uh, for, for legal professions is actually very, very critical. Um, we are coming towards the, the end of our session has been extremely interesting as well. And I, I, I hope uh, that uh, I think, I think we've, the, we've all learned uh, quite a bit uh, from each other, uh, including all the uh, participants as well. Um, maybe, uh, uh, you know, before we, we, we close, um, I'll do a shout out for um, Marlon. Uh, we, there's quite a, a bit of interest on uh, doing uh, crisis, uh, pro bono uh, during uh, crises as well. I think a session is coming up. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, there's providing legal services remotely, responding to crisis, expanding access to justice Asia. So that's going to be a specific sh uh, session on 23rd of September at 10 a.m. Uh, ICT. So uh, please uh, do sign up for that. Um, I think a lot of, uh, uh, of of the person of the organizations here were very creative in terms of using technology, Facebook, uh, and other platforms to you know uh, you know respond to uh, you know safe uh, distancing measure uh, restrictions as well. But uh, maybe uh, as we close, uh, you know, Saraj, any any last last thoughts for the audience uh, that you'd like them to take away uh, from this session? <coughs> Well, apart from uh, sharing uh, uh, what we have been doing, uh, that's a great opportunity to hear Mark and uh, from yourself, uh, from Michael, uh, from Simon, and uh, I'm good to know that uh, the Bar Associations of Australia do have uh, some footprint on uh, working for the pro bono. And I, I was going through uh, in chatting box where the lawyers, uh, they, the participant delegates, they are writing that they do have uh, such a uh, uh, facility pro bono uh, services uh, for those who have a low income into this one. 
So with uh, the uh, great solidarity uh, on this conference and the movement we are uh, making in the Asia uh, by the BAP cycles and uh, this uh, this conference, uh, let we commit ourselves that we uh, where where you have the directives you can uh, you can work on to this one where in my jurisdiction we have the directive but we are not fully implementing to this one and we encourage and we invite all the lawyers uh, from my jurisdiction and from all the jurisdictions of all over the country to have our best commitment uh, to ensure from our time that those who need the justice, we become the agent for the access to justice by means of these global services. Thank you. Well, well, well since Saraj and I, 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 the key ingredient, of course, is please attend uh, all the Asia Pro Bono conferences. It's one of the best ways to uh, really uh, get traction in your own countries as well. So I would say that that's not the key ingredient. It's probably like a, one of the main the main constituents of the dish itself. Uh, Mark, over to you. And any parting thoughts for the audience? Value add your attendance at this wonderful conference. There are very, very few problems that haven't been experienced by somebody else. This marvelous Asia Pacific uh, pro bono network, which has been developed over the last uh, decade or so, means there'll be somebody whom you can talk to to answer your challenge or your question. Get in touch with Babsia, get in touch with the uh, the organisers and use the uh, network that you've been a big part of with conferences like these to get the answers. Thanks, Mark. And maybe I just echo, uh, you know, the same message to all participants. I mean, you're not on your own. Often it's very lonely to get things going in your jurisdictions or but you're not on your own now that you're part of the uh, Asia Pro Bono uh, Conference family. Please reach out to all the panelists. Uh, you can email us directly. We're happy to share our experiences as well. Uh, we don't always get it right, but at least you can see what we struggle with, the challenges we've had. It gives you some reference point as well too. But the important thing is that, uh, you know, have the momentum going, you know, uh, come here, be refreshed from the interactions as well. And uh, just thank you so much. So uh, with that, um, I think the only thing now is the display of the uh, secret word. Is that, is that correct, uh, Bruce? Okay, Secretary. For all the attendees, they, uh, we have the secret word coming up. So please note it. Um, uh, if you get 75% of it. Secret word be coming up now. Okay, yes, we'll just wait for that. Excellent. Great job, everybody. Well done. And remember, in between the conferences we have, we have the quarterly roundtables. Uh, we talked about that yesterday, uh, and uh, there'll be one coming up in late November. Social justice, a beautiful uh, term. So, so great, everyone. Uh, we have uh, a break now for 30 minutes. And after that, uh, we have really vibrant sessions for uh, uh, two, two sections of today. And then, of course, we'll have the closing ceremony. Please, as many of you can, attend the cl closing ceremony this afternoon. Uh, we'll have our uh, uh, our pro bono pledges plus plus and we will be passing the flag forward thank you everyone and uh well done on this session that keeps building every year thank you all thank you so much take care